Open our hearts. Help us see a little better. Come a little closer. Be the people we were meant to be. Amen. Who is Jesus? A grand debate's been going on about that question for nearly 2,000 years. And according to the story appointed for this morning from the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> even Jesus wanted to know what people thought of him. And what he most wanted to know was what those he loved the most thought of him. Actually, Matthew's Gospel contains the most well-known version of this story. In that one, Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? John the Baptist said one. Elijah said another. One of the prophets said someone else. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, never shy, responds, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And there Jesus says, here are the keys to the kingdom. You're now the first pope or something to that regard, <laughs> which is fine. Not so in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He says he's going to die there on a Roman cross. Peter is scandalized. He rebukes Jesus. Jesus rebukes him back, calling him Satan, saying he doesn't think God's thoughts. Peter sees Jesus, he says, but not perfectly. The story that comes right before that in this gospel is telling. <clears throat> it tells of a man who's healed by Jesus of his blindness, but when he offers a, re a report of what he can see after the healing touch, he says he can see people now, but they look to him like trees walking. It's a wonderful, wonderful image. And then he receives a second touch from Jesus so he can see better. This is Mark's highly literary way of communicating the problem of Jesus. That when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? It reveals that when it comes to things of God, we all understand imperfectly. We somehow need a second touch. Well, I adore the version of today's text that survives in something else, the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas, which is not in our Bible. Jesus there asks his disciples to tell him what he's like. Bless you. And Simon answers, you are like a just messenger. Matthew says, you are like a wise philosopher. And finally, the disciple whose name is Thomas, goes home with the gold star when he says, Rabbi, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Very different from Matthew's version. It's very curious that we have built an entire religion around a person whom even those who knew and followed him did not understand. How are we then supposed to answer this question for ourselves when even the biblical authors, you know, we're stretching, we're trying to figure out who this was. As with individual Christians, the Christian church is not in total agreement about who Jesus is, never has been, and with every new century and with every new culture to which the gospel is introduced, we hear differing interpretations of who he is. As Albert Schweitzer said over a hundred years ago, each successive epoch has found its own thoughts in Jesus's thoughts, which was indeed the only way in which it could make him live. And so today we have a goodly number of differing interpretations of Jesus since people still tend to take for granted that Jesus thinks the way they do, right? There's, for instance, therapist Jesus. It's very popular today. He helps us cope with life's problems and love our inner child. He tells us how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. And there's Starbucks Jesus. <laughs> who drinks fair trade coffee, drives an electric car, and until recently went to film festivals. 
There's open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are not open-minded and who he would hate if he could, but he's Jesus, so he can't. <laughs> There's touchdown Jesus, right, who helps, helps athletes that we like run faster and jump higher than athletes we don't like. Thank you, Jesus, and go Ducks. I had to get that one in there. <laughs> There's January 6th Jesus who still thinks the election was stolen. And socialist Jesus who wishes Bernie was president. There's sustainability Jesus who never misses an opportunity to say, an opportunity to say loudly, I told you so about global warming and can't wait for the state of Florida to be completely underwater. There's spirituality Jesus, who hates religion, and churches, and pastors, and priests, and creeds, and would rather have people go out into nature and find the God within. And finally, there's Hello Kitty Jesus, which is just wrong. <laughs> so seen through a highly materialistic culture of the last, you know, 50 years, Jesus has come to be a materialist too. A few years back, I heard a woman on a Christian radio station talk show say that she wanted a new car and she had prayed and prayed and behold, she'd traded up to a fancy two-seater Lexus. Isn't God good, she said. And the radio minister agreed. Half the population of this planet lives on less than $2 a day. And God wanted more than anything to give her a Lexus. Now, don't get me wrong. I think people should be free to do whatever they want with the money that they have. But <laughs> really? Let's take one more look at open-minded Jesus, since that's the one I tend to like. Some years ago, I, I drove an old red square Volvo with the bumper sticker that said, Presbyterians, open-minded, open-hearted. And while that was still on my car, the Methodists stole that and made it the centerpiece of their national television campaign. <laughs> oh, it's Methodists. They have no shame. <laughs> anyway. Tolerance. Tolerance is a very important thing. I, but I can only give it two cheers, not three. Because tolerance can itself run a little amok. If it's a tolerance that believes that every idea is just as meaningful as every other idea. Because, you know, it's not enough to just say, well, I believe in God. People hate in the name of God, uh, the God they believe in. They They've killed thousands of Americans 20 years ago, yesterday, in the name of God. People legitimize their prejudices in the name of God. And Jesus had no use for this, as I said last week in my sermon then. He bet his life that God was not someone who would ask people to hate or kill in God's name. Just the opposite. There is just some kind of truth that is positively deep and abiding that happened, I believe, when in the first century, a Palestinian peasant named Yeshua chose to hang out with women who were not his family, talk to them, hear them out, invite them to follow him. It was saving. It saved them from being only, what, only half of what they were meant to be. Now, a lot of people who believe in God don't agree with that. They don't agree that women should be considered first-class human beings, but Jesus did. And look, Jesus was just warming up. He trumped even that when he chose to invite children. I mean, boy and girl children to climb up on his lap and ask him questions and bless their little heads like they were real people. Because in the first century, a parent might not even choose to name a child until it was five or six and had some reasonable chance of surviving to adulthood. 
They weren't hardly considered human by some. But honoring women and children was what Jesus was about. And in that, he was literally 2,000 years ahead of his time. When you think about it, it is phenomenal. His example is unprecedented in history. It is a God thing like no other God thing I know, which is why I chose to be a minister and stand up and say that. Do you want to know what God is like, asked Jesus. God does things like bless little children. Brothers and sisters, I think that is what our lives should be about. More on that next week. <laughs> now, tolerance is crucial in a free society. But it's also true that tolerance can be an excuse that we use to keep from making commitments. Let me tell you what I mean. People say, for instance, uh, quote, I like to read Wendell Berry and Alan Watts, and I'm drawn to Eastern religions. Well, not enough to actually study them. After all, we all have the same God, don't we? Well, I wonder, do we? I'm a Protestant Christian, just like the woman on the Christian talk radio show whose God enabled her to trade up to Alexis. But I'm not at all sure we, uh, you know, are in tune on the subject of God or what God wants for the world. T.S. Eliot took an advanced degree at Harvard University in the early part of the last century in Sanskrit and Eastern religions because he was drawn to them. I'm very drawn to them. A couple of years later, he gave it up before writing the dissertation. Why? Because he said, our Western culture is Judeo-Christian. Our laws, our values, our literature, our music, all come out of that ethos. We live in that culture the way fish live in the ocean. He said that life is just not long enough for a Westerner to adequately absorb the ethos of the East. Now that may or may not be true. I don't know. The fact is, though, that Eliot made a conscious choice to make peace with the fact of his birth and became an Anglican Christian. I asked Houston Smith, the great teacher of world's religions, about this 25 years ago over breakfast down in Ashland when we were hosting him at our church. He agreed with Eliot, saying it was part of the reason he himself had made a choice and embraced Christianity in his later years and had become a Methodist. <laughs> God bless Methodists. God bless Methodists. <laughs> what I am saying here, trying to be somewhat serious, is that we can be committed to something without being narrow. That takes some courage, though, too, right? I mean, remember, I remember a dear member of the church there in Ashland who told me once that she was at a party one Saturday night. It got to be 11 p.m. And she said, oh, I've, I've got to get home. I've got to get up early and teach Sunday school tomorrow morning. And she said that from the reaction she got, she might as well have said, I've got to get up in the morning because I need to go to the moon. Now, some of my colleagues in other churches uh, find this state of affairs depressing. The fact that Christianity is looked down upon. Well, I get that. But I find this to be the most exciting time to do what we're doing here. To be progressive Christians who follow the Jesus who supported women and children like almost no one before him. Because remember, in the 50s and 60s, people crowded into churches. People went to church whether it had anything to offer them or not. It was the thing to do. I think part of the reason may have been that 
There were all these guys who'd been in foxholes in World War II, and they'd offered up one prayer at least that said, if you get me out of this, God, I'm going to be in church every Sunday. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hunch I have. But, you know, now uh, churches are not full. This is a time when all the old props are gone. I know that when you come here or tune in, God bless you for tuning in on, on, uh, on us uh, here at Southminster on the internet. Uh, on a morning like this, it's a real choice you're making. I know that you could be doing a thousand other wonderful things. You do not come here for the same reason people came here 60 years ago. You didn't come here this morning to get ahead in your job or because three generations of your family sat in the pew you're sitting in. Maybe, but probably not, if we don't have pews. <laughs> what an amazing time it is to be a Christian when everybody isn't one. It's so much more interesting. You know, tolerance, once again, tolerance is a wonderful thing. We cannot survive without it. But it should never be an excuse for not settling in somewhere. For not making a choice. For not saying, I belong with these people. A man I know named Sam Keen once wrote a book called To to a dancing God. And in the chapter entitled Learning to Make Vows, he wrote this. He said, making a commitment to something or somebody is a dangerous thing. But so is never making any commitment at all. Now, we all know people who can't make commitments because they say, what if it isn't the complete truth? What if something else might be brighter than that? Someone had an answer for that. He said, I never thought that I had to prove I love my wife by hating other women. Who do you say that I am? Might this be a time for you to consider that question? The thing is, this text is wonderful, and it grabs me. And what grabs me in it is that Jesus isn't content to know what the prevailing idea of the day is about him. He wants to know what Peter and John think of him, you know, because he's invested in them. He loves them. He wants to know maybe even what you and I think of him. Who do you say that I am? Franz Kafka was once interviewed, and the text of that interview appeared after his death in Partisan Review in 1953. The interviewer asked Kafka the question that Peter answered in today's bit of scripture, who is Jesus for you? And Kafka, a Jew, answered this way. And it is my favorite definition of Jesus of all time. Kafka said, he is an abyss filled with light. One must close one eyes, one's eyes if one is not to fall into it. There is just something about him that tends to get under your skin, whether you like it or not. In 1960, I was a kid in a fourth grade Missouri Synod Lutheran vacation church school program in Sacramento, California. I do not remember much about the experience, except for a couple things. One is the teacher was, kind of had the smile that Brother Martin had. She was just wonderful. And that every morning they showed us a few minutes of a very low-budget 16-millimeter film about the life of Jesus. And what I remember from that was only one story. You know, I didn't know the life of Jesus at all at the time. 
It was a story of a woman taken in the act of something that authority figures in the film deemed unspeakable. Turns out it was adultery, but I was too young to know what that was. They threw her down in front of Jesus and demanded he judge her, but he refused to do that. He didn't even look her in the face to embarrass her. He cared about her that much. No, he simply said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. I was no more than 10 years old. I heard that I was hooked for life. Ever since then, I thought, there is the measure of wisdom with a capital W and the truest example of love I have ever known. I had no idea at the time how profound an effect that was going to have on my life. But I suppose I'm here today because when I was 10, they showed us that movie. He gets under our skin and will not let us go. Maybe you've had that experience, maybe not. An abyss filled with light. Close your eyes, you might fall into it. So, I want to close with a, an example of, of that. Uh, which comes right out of the life of the writer Anne Lamott. I don't know if you know Anne Lamott, but she's just wonderful. Decades ago, when the bottom had fallen out of her life, when she was physically ill, drinking way too much, using too many different kinds of drugs, completely out of ideas, she was lying on her bed, feeling miserable. She thought of herself as a lost cause. But weeks before this, she had begun hanging out on Sunday mornings outside a little church that I myself had been drawn to a year before that in Marin City, California. It was a small, struggling, you know, Presbyterian church that needed paint. They had a wonderful woman pastor. Church was made up of a rainbow of lovely people, a cross-section of the whole earth. Anne had not, had not gathered up the courage necessary to actually go into the church. She'd spent her time at the door, with the door open, taking it all in, feeling that she, an intellectual, an accomplished novelist, would rather die than be known as a Christian. So while she couldn't go inside, she couldn't quite stay away either. Anyway, she's laying there that night on her bed, feeling totally wiped out from a lifestyle that just isn't working for her anymore. And she writes, As I lay there, I became aware of someone with me hunkered down in the corner. The feeling was so strong that I actually turned on the light to make sure no one was there. And of course there wasn't. But after a while, in the dark again, I knew beyond any doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I feel my dog lying near me as I write this. Just sitting there, on his haunches, Jesus, in the corner of my sleeping loft, watching me with infinite patience and love. Amen. Me invite us to stand uh, for there's a wideness in God's mercy.
and joys, uh, things we're as happy about as we're concerned about. Yes, Kathy. Yeah. 